Okay, it's so good to be with you all. Ah, I'm stoked. You can't, I can't tell you how excited, it, excited I am and how happy I am and we are to be back. Um, we last came four years ago um, for our holiday and um, obviously as Mike said we were here seven years, but you know, we've been away for seven years, but to come back and see the church doing so well and thriving and seeing a whole bunch of new faces and catching up with old friends has been absolutely epic. So thank you for the privilege, Kate. Thank you for singing some of my old, favorite old songs. <laughs> Haven't sung those for seven years. I'm like, oh, this is glorious. Oh, it's so good. <clears throat> so you have to excuse me, I'm struggling with this cold still, but uh, I have the joy and the privilege, I think, of finishing off the sermon series on um, responding uh, to the presence of the Holy Spirit and experiencing God's presence. Um, and it's one of the absolute favorite things that I I, um, I get to teach on. So, uh, first of all, let me give you some greetings from Catch the Fire in Raleigh. No, you would say Raleigh, but over there they have to say Raleigh because they talk a bit slow. <laughs> and so I'm excited because I get to talk about Isaiah and wrath as opposed to Isaiah and wrath. And, and you know, you can look at me and, and, you know, hopefully you can, you know, if I don't throw too many Americanisms in, you know, I'm, I'm confused, to be honest. I'm like, which country am I in and what do we say in here, you know? Um, so anyway, that's cool. But we get, I get the privilege and the joy of talking with you about the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to start looking at um, John chapter 14. So if you want to turn to John 14, um, you know, and what I want to do is I want to I set a, a, f- a foundation uh, of, of who the Holy Spirit is and, and who is in us. I know you've been through that. It's like the end of the series, but... You know, I, I felt like, you know, what the Holy Spirit's been saying to me is what we believe sets our expectations for what we receive, right? So if we, if we believe, whatever we believe, that's our expectation of what we're going to receive. So if we believe that God is angry, what we expect to receive is judgment and wrath. Wrath. Right? If we believe that God is a good God, he's a, he's a He's a, a loving father, then what our expectation is, is that what we receive from him is love and joy and peace and kindness and all of the good stuff, right? So it's, it's really important that we, uh, you know, and I, I want to spend a little time just setting a, a, a foundation of, of, of who the Holy Spirit is for us, and then I want to talk a little bit about, well, how do we experience more of God? Because that's his desire for all of us. You know, his desire for us is that we get to experience one degree of glory to another degree of glory. That's 2 Corinthians 3, 4, 3, whatever it is, right? That we, that we grow and we experience that, that the Christian life is one of ever-increasing intimacy and joy and life and freedom in the Holy Spirit, right? Not one of sh- struggling and challenge and difficulty. Now, yes, we have difficulty and we have challenge. You know, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Woohoo! Right? But he says, take heart, for I've overcome the world. And we get to experience that. You know? And so my heart, my prayer, my desire for, for me as I'm speaking for all of us is that we, we get a glimpse of who God, has, who God is for us and who he's calling us to be. And that we actually have a hunger and an expectation that we step into greater realms of glory. Because that's what he has for us. You know, it says um, that in, in Romans chapter 3, he's, uh, God says, uh, Paul's writing and he says, for we have sinned and all fallen short of the glory of God, right? That means that we were once destined for glory, but we've fallen short of it. What the Father wants to do and what he's doing through Jesus is to restore us to glory. Hebrews chapter 2 where it says that Jesus, when he ascended to heaven, what did he do? He returned many sons to glory. You and I have been destined to live in the glory and the goodness of God. Even though we have trouble in the world, we're destined to experience the majesty and the goodness, to live in greater and greater glory realms. It's good. This Madonna thing is falling off my head a lot, but there we go. (laughs) Holiday. Okay, so John chapter 14. Verse 8, we're going to look at verse 8 to verse 21. Now, just a bit of context. So this is, this is um, Jesus. We're going to, you know, there's the, the, the story, the back story is that Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's with his disciples, uh, and he's just shared this famous phrase where, you know, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Just remember that the Father is the ultimate destination. And, and so he's, you know, he's He's having this discussion, and we start in verse 8, where Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, 
And it's enough for us. Because Jesus has been talking so much about the Father that they want to know him. And Jesus says, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, you can hear Jesus' exasperation, can't you? How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Oh, it's glorious. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In, the, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Mm. I love that passage of Scripture. It's going yellow in my Bible, that page. I think I've thumbed it so much. It's such a great, great passage. You know, where Jesus is saying, I'm not, he's about to go to heaven, he's going to the cross, and he's saying, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, I'm going to bring you with another helper, which we know is the Holy Spirit. That other helper who's going to be one, just like him. The disciple, he's saying to them, look, you're going to know who he is because you've been with him all of this time. Referencing himself and the Holy Spirit resting upon Jesus. And, and so, you know, his, his promise is, I will be in you, I will come to you, I will not leave you as orphans. You know, and it's so important that we understand, and I, I just want to spend a little moment, uh, not that I fully understand it, but I'm on a journey of understanding it, that God is not out there, but he's in here. The Holy Spirit is not someone that we have to cry and pray and ask for, them to, for him to come, he's actually already here with us. You know, there, there is this this um, duality, I suppose, in the, in the Bible where we, you know, we're filled with the Spirit, but then Paul says we'll keep receiving, be filled with the Spirit, but the, you know, and there is that dichotomy, but the truth is that we are now filled with the Spirit. He's not out there, he's in here. And it's really important that we understand that. And, and the key phrase, you know, where we talk about the greater works, I mean, I'd just like to do the good works of Jesus, right? I don't know about you, just doing the works of Jesus, you know, seeing someone raised from the dead, which is our inheritance, by the way. Just seeing that would be good enough for me, let alone whatever the greater works Jesus is talking about. When we, we'll, we'll put those aside for a minute. Great, good work, the, the works would be good, right? And can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen. Right, and so Jesus is saying, whoever believes in me, I'm gonna, this, you're going to do the same things I'm gonna, uh, that I've done. I'm, you're going to heal the sick, you're going to raise the dead, you're going to cast out demons, you're going to prophesy, you're going to have words of knowledge, you're going to experience things that aren't in the natural realm, and you're going to see them in the spiritual realm, and you're going to release them right? That is our inheritance. That's what he's done from the Spirit. But the key thing in that, the key to doing the greater works, the key phrase, if you like, is actually um, in verse 12, when he says, truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do. The key is because I'm going to the Father. It's not, the key, the key word isn't believe, the key is I'm going to the Father. Because we need to understand, the, from a theological point of view, what, what Jesus has done. So his mission on earth was to, was to come and rescue a people for himself, right? His mission was to come and take away the sin of the world, to take it upon himself, to atone for our sin, to atone for, you know, take all of the punishment that was upon us, every wrong thing that we've done, every wrong thing that Adam has done, you know, from Adam, from the very first Adam, right the way to Jesus returns. All of that sin, like a, an eternal vacuum cleaner, just sucking up and coming into and being laid upon Jesus. Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, you know, that, that um, you know, surely he has borne off infirmities and our sorrows. We consider him stricken, but God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. 
And, and so his, his mission was to come and to deal with our sin. In fact, to take the law, which was just continually pointing out sin and saying, you've done it wrong, you've done it wrong, you should be here, you're here, you should be here, you're here, is pointing it out all the time. And Jesus came and he took all of that sin and he took the law and it says it nailed it to the cross. It's glorious news that you don't have to struggle with your sin. You don't have to, you're not in a battle that you can't, you know, that you can't win. You're in a battle that you cannot lose. And he nailed to the law, to the cross, it says in Colossians 2. He canceled the record of debt, and it's now being fulfilled in us who believe. That he's the, the, the blood of Jesus, as it says in Hebrews 12, the blood of Jesus is speaking a better word over you. Because now, we're, now the blood of Jesus has taken all of the price of all of our sin, all of our guilt, all of our shame, all of the condemnation is laid out on Jesus, and we don't get any of it. Free. No condemnation. And we're there, and we're free from the law, and the blood of Jesus is always speaking over us. It's speaking mercy. It's speaking grace. He's speaking purpose. He's speaking destiny. He's speaking provision. He's always speaking. He's calling out a better word that every time in heaven what's being spoken over you is good words, good things. And he's, of course, defeated death and Satan, and he's disarmed them, and he's made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in the cross. And so that's what Jesus has done. And so Jesus is saying, well, here's the thing. I'm going to the Father. I'm going. Now, when I go, then you're going to do the greater works because when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is the evidence that we have now been caught up in the Trinity. Because the thing about salvation isn't just that Jesus has somewhere done it for us. It's that actually we've now become one with him. That on the cross, we, have now, we were put inside Jesus. Right? We're in Christ Jesus. It's not like we're outside of Christ. No, we're, we're in Christ. That means that Christ is in us, and we're in Christ, and we're hidden in God, right? It's, it, we are forever in. We're forever in. We can't be separated from his love. The, the, on, the, on the fire of the cross, what happened was that we died with him, that we were included into the Trinity, and when Jesus was raised and he went back up into heaven, we've been taken back up with him, and the Holy Spirit is the evidence that that's happened. You don't have to beg for God to be with you. He's with you eternally because of what Jesus has done for you. That's good news. It's very good news, isn't it? I mean, I could do like a little dance. It's so good. And so Jesus is saying, I'm going to the Father, and he's, because what he's then doing is he's creating the opportunity for us to be forever one with him, to be fused like, fused like metal together, fused to him. Not that we ever diminish who God is, right? God still is God, but somehow in the glory of the Trinity, we get invited in, and we now live in the Trinity. You know that you have an address in heaven right now. You're seated in heaven. Your spirit, in accordance with 1 Corinthians 6, 17, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, you, you are joined to the Lord and you are now one spirit with him, right? That's good. It means nothing can separate us from his love. It means that we're with him, he's with us. And Jesus is saying, um, you know, verse 21, and he who loves me will be loved by my father. I will love him. I will come and I will live with him. I will manifest myself with him. It's our inheritance because Jesus has gone to the father. John 7, 30. 9 to 41, you know, it says, anyone who's thirsty, come and believe in me. Whoever believes in me will, you know, will receive rivers of, rivers of living water. They'll flow out. And he says, and this he talked about the Holy Spirit, whom had not yet given because Jesus had not been glorified. But now that he's been glorified, we now have the Holy Spirit. We've been included in the Trinity. And the, just briefly, the Holy Spirit is the transmitter of love and he's the receiver of love in us. Right, his, his, his job, because we've now been we're in Christ, his job is to continually pour out his love into our hearts. Like a, not just a, like a little trickle, but an absolute Noah's Ark deluge of love. That he's continually saying to us, I love you, you're my son whom I love, you're my daughter whom I love, I'm so pleased with you, you're so glorious, you're so beautiful, uh, my grace is always sufficient for you, you are the object of my love, you're the apple of my eye, you're my happy thought. I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it, if you think about it? Because I'm so conscious of my failures and my weaknesses, but he's always looking at me with love. And so he's, he, you know, we've included, but not, not only is he transmitting that love, but he's giving us power on the inside to receive that love and, to, and, and for one in our spirits to be witnesses and, to, you know, the Holy Spirit witnessing to us and saying, yeah, you know, you are a son. I'm a son, I'm a son, I'm a son. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Right? Now, I can't do that without the Holy Spirit. He's, he's transmitting. He's receiving. We've been cl- included in. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' gift to us. His evidence that we're now seated in heavenly places. And he didn't, it didn't just come, I think it, I heard Todd White. I don't know if you know Todd White. He's a crazy evangelist in America. Well, he's not crazy. He just does crazy things. And um, I heard him say, you know, that Jesus didn't die to get us to, just to get us to heaven, but he died to get heaven into us. So we carry heaven. We, because of the Holy Spirit, we're carrying around the precious Holy Spirit, the life of heaven, the resurrection power of God. He's his empowering presence. Our, you know that your spirit is encountering and living in heaven all of the time. Right now, your spirit is encountering the Holy Spirit. It's good news, isn't it? You can't be separated from God's love. You can't be separated. You've been joined, forever joined with God. You are one spirit with him. Not that we diminish God, but somehow he draws us up into that glorious Trinitarian life. Come on. And so he's, he's, so Jesus is saying, I'm going to send my spirit to you. He's going to live in you. He's going to dwell upon you. He's going to be one just like he's been just like now where you've been experiencing the Holy Spirit through, Je- through me, Jesus, now you're going to experience the Holy Spirit for yourselves and you're going to, he's going to cause you to live in such a way that you manifest and you reflect the glory of God. He's going to cause you to live in such a way that you are many Jesuses walking around on the earth. He said, you know him. You've been with him. You know, I think it was Bill Johnson who, uh, from Ra- uh, Bed- Bed- Bedding in Rethel, Bethel in Redding, California, and you know, his, he wrote this book, uh, When Heaven Invades Earth, or something like that, and you know, his controversial claim at the beginning was that Jesus could do nothing by himself. Uh, everything that he did, he did by the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's true, and what Jesus is saying here is, you know him, he's been with you because he's been on me, and everything that I've done, I've done by the Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit. We're included into the very same life of the, of the Trinity, and so I... I, I I just want to take a moment to bless your spirits, because you're already connected with the Holy Spirit, spirit to spirit, and I just I want to bless your spirits. I want you. To, I want to bless your spirits to come to the fore, for your emotions and your soul and your mind to push back, and for the spirit for you to be led by the spirit, and for your spirit to lead you. So I just receive that blessing. So, we, so theologically, it's important that we understand why we believe what we believe. Theologically, we are now one with Christ Jesus in the Holy Spirit. Right? We are, if you are a believer in Jesus, then you're in Christ Jesus and you are one with the Holy Spirit. Okay? If you're not a believer of G- in Jesus, the only way for you to experience life and fullness and then eternal life which starts now, by the way, because eternal life is knowing Jesus, according to John 17. The only way to experience that is to actually confess your sin and believe in Jesus. And so, we, we, you know, we, we have the Holy Spirit, but the thing that, you know, we, we live in this tension of have living and experiencing the Holy Spirit, but actually knowing that there's more for us to experience and encounter. Right, I read things like this, you know, the greater works, and, and I, as I said before, I'm happy just to take the works, and I, and I see the truth of theologically who Christ has made me to be, that I'm now one with him in spirit, that I'm full of the Holy Spirit. I see my life, and I think it doesn't quite line up just yet. Right? But I, we're not to live by our experience, we're to live by the truth of the word, and so the invitation, or my expectation, is that I continually have encounters with God that make that the truth of what's already happened to me, to make that more and more of a reality, right? When Ash and I got married, the Bible says that we're one flesh. That's, you know, uh, in uh, Genesis 2, it says a husband and a man shall leave his wife, and, and, and a wife will leave her, no. That's what I've been doing wrong. No, I'm just joking. The husband and wife will leave her parents and will be joined with his wife and they will become one spirit, right? One flesh. Yeah, we teach that. We preach that at weddings. 
Now, the truth is, so when Ash and I were married, we became one flesh. Did I manifest that one fleshness straight away? Ash will say, no! Did I, did I, am I still learning how to put my own knees to the side and to yield to what she wants and to uh, ask her what she would like to do as opposed to just deciding what we're going to do? Uh, do, you know, do, do, I have to do, I, do I have to learn how she thinks and learn how she behaves and, and, and understand what's going on and the mystery that is the female species? Do I have to do that? Absolutely. Am I one with her? Yes. Am I manifesting that oneness? No. But I have to learn how to manifest that. And how do I do that? Through relationship. You know, the only way I can, I can, uh, I can get to know Ash more and more is by actually spending time with her, experiencing her, having date nights, doing all those kind of things, right? She'd be saying chance would be a fine thing, right? <laughs> and so... We are one with Christ but the, uh, and, and full of the Spirit, but at the same time, there's, there's, there's more to experience and to understand. Do we, do, is, that, is that okay? Is that clear? And so how do we experience more of the Holy Spirit? And, you know, the Holy Spirit is amazing. And there's different ways. You know, if we start from the point of view that he's with us and he's always, you know, we're joined to him and he's therefore he, and he's the most communicative person in the, in the, in the planet. Right? He speaks the most. He doesn't always speak in words. Sometimes he speaks in circumstances. But he's always speaking to us. He's always pouring out his love. How do we experience more of the Holy Spirit, someone who we're already one with? How do we experience more? How do we, you know, and which is going to be the key to the greater works and, and to the life in the Spirit and all those kind of things. How do we, how do, we do that? You know, again, if, if we've got to think about well, if what we believe will, ex will affect what we receive, if we believe that God is relational, he loves us, he has so much good for us that he didn't spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how much more will he give us all things, as it says in uh, Romans 8.32. If we believe that God is good all of the time, then our expectation is that he's, there's a, he's a good God who's a relational God who actually wants to take, take us into deeper and deeper realms of encounter and experience. Yes. So how do we encounter God? Well, you know those moments where you're just in worship and all of a sudden you feel the presence of God and it's like you get this sense of the love of God being poured in your heart and all of a sudden in your heart you start to explode and you're like, Whoa, he loves me! Whoa, woo! Just me gets those. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> You know, the, Romans 5.5 5 says that the love of God is being poured out in our hearts, well, how? By the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we experience God because we, we, his, he, what he's always doing is he's always pouring love into our hearts. Right? right here, right now, he's pouring love into your heart. The question is, are we tuning into that love or not? Right? I used to think that my, my behavior would bring me into God and then out of God and then into God and then out of God. If I was a bad boy and I didn't pray or read my Bible enough, then I'd be outside of God. And if I was a good person and I prayed and I worshipped, then I'd be back in God's graces. And somehow there was this line that I was in, out, in, out, in, out, based on my experience and my behavior, like I can change God. <laughs> uh, the truth is, I'm always in. It's just, he's always pouring love. Is The question is, am I tuning into that or not? Am I receiving that or not? Am I living in the good of that or not? Right? And so he's pouring out his love. And, and the word, pour out, it actually, it's like, it means a Noah's Ark deluge. Right? It's like that level of deluge. It's not like a little, little, little trickle. It's a, a flood, a torrent of love. It's, you know, he always wants to come and pour out his love upon us. You know, sometimes when he comes and he pours out his love upon us, we stand there and nothing happens other than maybe we feel a little warm on the inside. Or maybe we don't feel anything at all. Sometimes when we experience the love of God, we shake and we fall and we laugh and we cry and we roll all over the place. I don't even ever experienced that, right? Back in 1994, he referenced it last week, you know, there was this outpouring of the Holy Spirit in, from, in Toronto and uh, catch, what's now, was. Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship, now Catch the Fire Toronto. And the Holy Spirit came, and it was associated with laughter and 
falling down and people were barking and roaring like lions and it was kind of got some strange press and um, people were decrying it. Uh, but what was going on was in all of those things, the love of God was being poured out. And so, you know, and John Arnott, who's our sort of senior leader, uh, you know, he, he, they, you could call him the oak tree. You know, and, and there would be moments where there would be a room full of four or 5,000 people. Four million people came to visit the church over about a 10-year period. And there'd be a moment where the Holy Spirit and the entire room was like chaos, everyone on the floor, laughing, crying, falling, shaking, screaming, doing whatever, experiencing God, and John would be like, You know, sometimes we can get a little focused on the manifestations. Sometimes we can kind of, we, we have this problem, we can do it two ways. One is, that's weird. I'm not doing that. Don't ever come do that to me, Holy Spirit. You're a gentleman. <laughs> I don't know where it says in the Bible that he's a gentleman, but apparently he's a gentleman. Because a whole bunch of preachers said so. So the first response can be, I'm not that, that, don't, don't. Don't make me laugh and fall and shake and whatever, because that's undignified. The second response is, I'm not laughing, falling, or shaking, so you can't be here. Right? So I love how the fact that God used uh, someone who, to oversee uh, and a renewal and an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was characterized by crazy manifestations, and he didn't manifest once. I love that. Because it's not about the manifestations. You know, but, 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 but you know, when you plug into or you experience the overwhelming force of the universe, do you think that you might actually have some kind of response? Let's think about it. You know, in America we have 110 volts and it's much safer, but here we've got, what, 220? If you stick your finger in an electric socket, what's gonna happen? You, <laughs> you, you might shake, right? Or you might just go, mm, as one of our friends did when he got electrocuted. If you experience the power of the universe, the one who created the universe, who's outside of the universe and heals the universe in the span of his hand, if he shows up, the wonder isn't that you, uh, that you um, manifest, the wonder is that you get to survive, that you live through it. And you get to tell the tale of another day. God showed up, really? Ooh. And so, you know, uh, the manifestation of God, of, you know, the Spirit, and, and I, you know, I don't want to get hung up on that. I don't want us to get hung up on that. I don't want you to, to either look for it unhealthily or, or, or just decry it. But the reality is when God shows up, things happen, and it's okay, right? You know, if the creator of the universe shows up and nothing happens, then we're in trouble. And so, we, you know, we can experience God. We can experience his love being poured out in our hearts. Sometimes that might mean that we'll shake. Sometimes that might mean that we'll laugh. Sometimes that will mean that we cry. Sometimes that means that we uh, make a noise like a turkey. I mean, who knows, right? That's not the presence of God. The presence, that's just God. That's just your body responding to God. But, but you know, it doesn't always have to be with these great whiz-bang signs and wonders and poof. You know, one of the, my favorite ways to encounter God and to experience more of the Holy Spirit is actually by sitting down with the Bible and opening up the Bible and spending two hours studying what God's saying and experiencing the living truth of God and Him jumping off the page and, my, and the truth that's up here going into here and all of a sudden I'm starting to think, I can believe this, wow! You know, sometimes we're looking for these great whiz-bang experiences and... and, and and, and I want them more than any of you, okay? I want them. I want to experience God's raw power and his glory. But sometimes I just, when I read this and I experience the very same thing, I might not shake and fall, but, but I'm experiencing the Holy Spirit because he's the spirit of what? Wisdom and revelation. And so we're experiencing through the word and I, and I love just to get that, to dig in and get the truth of the word and have that speak to me. But I, I, then we can experience God and worship. We can experience him in what we call soaking, which is just lying down on the floor and, and, and listening to some music and just falling asleep, sloking or something, you know. We can, we, can, we can experience God in worship as we, you know, we're getting caught up and we're getting just overwhelmed with his presence. We can experience God in silence. That's the one I hate the most. 
You know, it's that still small voice that I, you know, Elijah had. He comes in the, you know, he's in the little detail, you know. And I, I remember once praying, and I was preparing a message, and I was, it was Saturday morning, and I still had no clue what I was going to preach on. Uh, it's just sort of fairly common for me at the moment. And, um, <laughs> and I'm like, I started to journal. I'm like, Lord, I'm really annoyed. You know, you're so slow. Why don't you just speak to me? And, I, you know, I can get on with it. And, and, and you know, I remember him saying to me, you know, my slowness and my silence is my gift to you. Because you would just run away. If I gave you something, you'd just run off and think, thanks very much, and off you go. But I actually like to hang out with you, so I don't give you much. I just let you sit in silence for a bit. Oh, great. So I sit in silence, and we experience just a very quiet sense of the Holy Spirit coming and Him pouring out His love in us and, and just that revelation sometimes that comes of, and all of that. We can experience Him through dreams and visions, and then we experience Him through community. One of the way, my, my favorite ways to experience God is to have someone else who's a friend of mine just come and love me or do something cool, do something kind, help me move house or whatever, right? And I'm experiencing the presence of God. So, you know, for us, our life is, is, is designed to be, is called to be a life of encounter. You know, that's, you know, um, there's that story in, in um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke about Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, where he, he goes up the mountain, and he gets up the mountain, and all of a sudden, this cloud appears, and Moses and Elijah are with him, and, and the voice comes out of the cloud that says, uh, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. You know, remember that story? Um, and, and, you know, Peter, who's terrified as I probably would be as well, you know, experiencing the glory cloud. And he's like, uh, 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 what, what, what should we do? Let's, let's, let's build a booth so that we can make a monument so we can come back and we can camp out here and we can say, oh, look, last year, do you remember? Last year when we were here, God showed up and there was a cloud of glory. And then 10 years, ago, 10 years would go by, oh, you remember 10 years ago we were on that hill and look, there's that, tr- there's that booth that's just there that was there specially that we designed to commemorate the glory of God. The thing is, Jesus says, no, don't be stupid. We're not building a house. Why? Because I remember the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, every encounter with me is an invitation for another encounter. We're not to camp out on last year's revelation. We're not to count out, camp out on 10 years ago, God, or 20 years ago, God did something amazing in Toronto, and I laughed on the floor for three days, and it was glorious. I wish he would do it again. Every experience, every encounter, whether it's encountering in the Word, encountering in worship, being sitting in silence at home, whether it's soaking, whether it's being out in the street and the Holy Spirit just drops something in your heart for someone else and you go and you know, release a prophetic word, whatever that is, every encounter is an opportunity and an invitation for more. Because we're going from one degree of glory to another. And how do we do that? According to 2 Corinthians 3, we behold His glory face to face. And those encounters are to bring us into greater realms of glory and experience and love and joy and freedom and life. You know, he's a good God and he wants us to experience his presence. One of the things that I've been learning, and I'm a bit slow, but one of the things I've been learning is his presence isn't just for Sundays. You know, there's something about um, God being amongst us that's glorious and amazing. You know, Matthew 18, Jesus says, you know, if two or three are gathered together, there I am if we're gathered in his name. There's something powerful about being together. And, you know, the writer to the Hebrew says, don't give up meeting with each other because it's so important, right? Where we get to experience as a corporate anointing and a corporate dimension that's glorious and beautiful. And my hope and my prayer for your church and for my church is that those experiences of corporate glory go up and up and up and up, right? That you have moments in your meetings where the glory of God is so thick upon you, just like when, he, when the temple was dedicated, that the presence of God was so thick that the worship leaders couldn't lead a worship, and the preacher couldn't preach, and everybody's flat on the floor. That's my ambition for you, okay? That's my ambition from us as a church in Catch the Fire in Raleigh. You know, that, we, that there's such a presence and the weightiness of the God's glory that is just so thick, and that because when, when, when we're together, he's amongst us in power. But it's not the only place that he shows up. He shows up in all manner of, uns- of quite surprising places. He shows up in schools and in workplaces and at home. 
know, the experience, the, the challenge, our, my challenge for myself and for you is that, that we actually, because He's a good God, because we know that we're one with Him, because He's always wanting to pour out and release experience upon us, that we're actually hungering and pursuing every day experiences and encounters with Him, whether it's a minute moment where we just experience a bit of His love as we're on the bus, or whether there's this glorious vision that opens up to us as we're, you know, worshiping at home or sitting in the office and having a problem and he needs, you know, we need a creative solution to a report that we can't write, right? He's as interested in that. He wants to show his glory as much there as he does here. Right? Uh, a few months ago, uh, uh, I shouldn't wrap up, but uh, let me tell a quick story. A few months ago, I was, um, well, actually last year, I went to Izzy's school in grade 11. She was in year 11 and doing a world cultures and religions class, and the, when the teacher found out that I was uh, a pastor of a charismatic church, um, he was very interested, so they invited me in to come and speak at the class for an hour and a half or whatever it was, and, and, and I, so I, I did about 20 minutes of introduction, gave some time for, for God, uh, to, you know, for them, then gave some time for questions, and one of the questions, the first question was, tell us about the Holy Spirit and what's all this speaking in tongues? So I had like a half an hour conversation about speaking in tongues, and, uh, and in the middle of it, one of the kids said to me, so um, can you speak in tongues anywhere? I said, yes. And of course, you can't speak about the Holy Spirit without speaking about Jesus, and you can't speak about Jesus without speaking about the Father. And so you, I wasn't allowed to preach the gospel, but in sharing the story, you get to preach the gospel. Um, but they said, so can you speak in tongues anywhere? Yes. Could you speak in tongues here? Yes. Could you speak in tongues now? I'm like, mm, Yes. But you've got to remember it's sacred. It, I don't want you to laugh. How are you going to respond? Oh, you know, oh no, we won't laugh. So I, I spoke in tongues for about a minute. Of course, they're all like, oh. Uh, and about, you know, and then all this question and conversation, and there's a cutting the story short. But um, about ten, five minutes later, this kid who was sitting over here, who was of Pakistani origin, he says to us, well, you know, you didn't see my face, but when you spoke in tongues, there, uh, you said a phrase in Arabic that I recognized. And everyone's like, oh. What did he say? What did he say? There's me thinking, darn it, I should have interpreted it. That was so, I'm so theologically incorrect right now. Where was the interpretation? But there he is from a Pakistani ch child who's an atheist, you know, or maybe even of another faith. And he, you know, in fact, he was of another faith. And they said, what did he say? What did he say? He said, well, he's something like, honor the great prophet Jesus Christ. What should I do? Should I just convert now? I'm like, I signed a waiver to say I wasn't going to preach the gospel, so I'm like, uh, I said, I don't, you know, I hope this was wisdom. I said to him, uh, not just being a chicken, I, I hope, I said to him, well, that's your choice, but I think God's trying to tell you something. God shows up all over the place. He's not, re, re, he's not, he's not confined to a building, and he's not confined to our little minds. He can do more than we can ask or imagine. In fact, that's his speciality. And his desire is to, pour, to, be pour, to keep coming and encountering us. His desire, I think it was Paul Manwaring of Bethel, I heard this, you know, his desire is that we drink to become a river. You know, Hugh touched on it last week in, in uh, John chapter uh, 7. You know, that he who out of his belly, he who believes out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And that we drink, we receive you know, I, I, I find space in my life to experience God's presence and intentionally, not just, I'm always in his presence, but just in the same way with my marriage with Ash, we find time to actually experience intimacy and oneness and we, and we enjoy and we sit and he pours out his love and I drink. Sometimes, I, I mean, I, sometimes I'm really, can I be slightly, in the, 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 I can't even say it, theologically incorrect, Push, it, push the envelope a little bit. Sometimes I take a, a fake imaginary shot glass and I have a drink of the Holy Spirit. And then I make it into a wine glass and I have a drink of the Holy Spirit. Then I make it into a bucket and I stick my head in it. Not because there's anything magical or mystical, it's just because it's going out of my mind and coming into my heart. And so we, t we drink to become a river. We we're saying yes to the Holy Spirit. We're experiencing his love. We're allowing him. We're yielding to him. We're drinking. We're drinking. But then we're saying, actually, what I've got on the inside of me is too good to hold to myself. Let me release it to others around. Let me release it prophetically. Let, it, let me release it in a word of knowledge. Let me release it just in love and hospitality and all those other gifts that we know. 
Because God's motive is to pour his love into us and then through us to pour his love out to the world around us. Right? Even the gifts of the Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit has been talking to me about those. You find them in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and in Romans 12. Uh, you know, the gifts of the Spirit, various gifts of the Spirit. If you think about it, what they really are are their manifestations of love. Because God is a good God. He is love. So a prophetic word is a manifestation of his love. What he is saying to that person is God loves you so much that he sees everything about you and he sees your future or he sees where your heart is at and he's releasing it to you, right? Hospitality, God loves you so much that he's going to actually take care of your needs, right? Those, those things are love gifts. They're, they're things to experience and encounter that we drink. You know, there's that, fam that famous passage in Ezekiel 47 of the river of God flowing out from the throne. Where is the throne? It's right here. The Holy Spirit wants us to drink, to experience his presence in greater and greater measure, not to be limited by our past, but actually to step forward into the future. Why? So that we can not just be, feel like we're good and have a Holy Spirit praise party and have a little swimming pool here, but actually to become a river that releases life to the world around us, that releases the love of God. I'm going to finish with this. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, this is Jesus speaking to the church in Laodicea, you know, the, the one that's really lukewarm. <laughs> he says this, and I make that face because I often see in myself the church in Laodicea. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Let me just unpack that very quickly. Behold, I'm knocking at the door. What's that? It's Jesus is saying, I'm here. I'm here. Are you going to let me in? Now, he's already in us, right? I've already said that. But in terms of our understanding, our mindset, our, the reality of experiencing his presence, he's knocking at the door of our lives, knocking at the door of our hearts and saying, I'm here. What's the next word he says? If any man. Well, that says opportunity. What that says is, is anybody. It's not for the special anointed preacher or even the unanointed preacher. It's not for the church pastor. It's for anyone. If anybody, if any man comes, if any man Right? And then hears my voice is to recognize the Holy Spirit. It's to t learn to recognize, ah, that's the Holy Spirit right there. That little whisper, that little brush of wind that I just felt, that little, uh, that little prompting on the inside, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I, I want to recognize your voice. And then opens the door, well, what's that? That's a response. You're knocking, I hear you, I recognize here I am, open up ancient doors, let the king of glory come in. And then what's the result? Well, Jesus wants to come in and have communion and to dine and to have intimacy and to eat a glorious meal, a banquet of uh, glorious food and experiencing his presence and his love. The question is, are we hearing his voice? Are we hearing him knocking and are we responding to him? Are we yielding to his presence? Or are we saying, no, I haven't got time for that, or no, it's too weird, or no, Holy Spirit, I don't think you're really here. Or are we saying, I don't really understand quite how you work. Does anyone know how the Holy Spirit really works? No. I don't quite understand how you work, but I'm saying yes to you anyway. I'm opening the door because I know that you're a good God who loves me passionately, who has good things for me, and he wants me to experience, you want me to experience the richness of life in you leave you with a Smith Wigglesworth quote. Everyone who has received the Holy Spirit has within him great possibilities and unlimited power. He also has great possessions, not only of things that are present, but also of the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit has power to equip you for every emergency. If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, believe it is your right and your privilege to have anything in the Bible. Don't let your human mind interfere with the great plan of God. Submit yourselves to God. It's good, isn't it? And sometimes we just have to take off our rational mindset that says God can and can't do that 
and we'll put little boxes around him. And we're very good at church at putting little boxes around what God can do, right? I remember Roland Baker hearing, hearing him say once, you know, if only the Holy Spirit was as mature as those pastors, then they could let him out a bit more. <laughs> I'm like, ha, 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 ooh, that's me. <laughs> right? That we create space and we yield to the Holy Spirit. And yielding basically just looks like saying, okay, Holy Spirit, here I am, come and get me. Whatever you want to do in my life, I want to experience all you've got. Oh, and then I want some more because there's more. Oh, and then I want some more because there's more. It's the greater works that flow out of a place of intimacy and experiencing, of communion, of Jesus by the Spirit sitting down and eating with us. So we're just going to take a moment, if that's okay with you, to invite the Holy Spirit to come and join us. Well, he's not join us. That's a stupid thing to say because he's already here. But to come and manifest himself amongst us.